So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. You may be seated. The law exposes your nakedness before God. That might seem by a, a strange term, especially uh, within the text we just read. But if we go back to Genesis, and that's where we had our scripture reading from this morning, and I know I do spend a lot of time going back to those first couple chapters in Genesis, and I thought about that as I was, as I was thinking about the message this week. And I thought, well, the reason for that is, is because those first few chapters are indeed so foundational to the rest of Scripture. And to what I think even Paul is saying here today. Though Paul's not directly referencing that, though he does elsewhere in Romans. Because if we go back to the story of Adam and Eve, you remember as we read, right? The serpent comes and he tempts Adam and he tempts, or excuse me, he tempts Eve and she eats and then Adam eats. And it says they try to cover themselves. That's very important. They realized they were naked and they tried to cover themselves. Just keep that in mind. They tried to cover themselves. Not only do they try to cover themselves physically, they tried to cover themselves spiritually. And how do they do that? It was the woman, God, and it's your fault because you made her. It's not my fault, Eve. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. And so their outward covering showed what they were trying to cover on the inside. They try, and ultimately what we see what they tried to do is they tried to cover their sin without God, didn't they? They tried to solve their own sin problem. Now when we look at our text here in Romans 7.13, um, first thing here in 13, I think the first question I want to ask us today is, what exposes your sin and why? Now we've been talking about this, but think about Adam and Eve for a moment. Right, think about Adam and Eve. What exposed their sin? Right, they, they, they eat of the tree, which was God's law, right? God's law, in the beginning, very simple. Don't eat that tree, right? No, you may not have a cookie. And then they reach for the cookie, right? Pretty simple. Okay, can't eat of it. They eat. Eyes are open. We're naked. God comes. We're naked, so we hid. How'd you know you were naked? Well, we ate of the tree. So what exposed their nakedness? The law. The Word of God exposes their nakedness that they broke. And what does that do then? It brings death, right? It brings death to Amity. They die spiritually and ultimately they die physically this day. Or they will die physically. Now, when we, we look here now in Romans... Right? Did that which is good then bring death to me? Did the law, did God's law bring death to Adam and Eve? It brought the sentence, didn't it? Doesn't the law bring the sentence? When you go before the judge, let's say you murdered somebody, and the judge says, we, you've been found guilty, therefore the law says that you should get the death penalty. I know we don't believe in that anymore, but they used to. Okay? You get the death penalty. Is it the law's fault that you died? No, it's because you murdered somebody. Right? It's not the law's fault. Right? And that's what Paul's asking you 30. Did that which is good, that being the law, is God's law which is good, which condemns me to death, did that bring death to me? If we just got if God just if God just got rid of his law, then would I be A okay? And of course, Paul's answer is, by no means. The problem, again, is not the law, which, notice Paul is really banging on this. 
Why do you think he's hammering on this so hard? Because we have a tendency to do what? Blame God. We have a tendency to cover up our sins. So he keeps pushing in on this. Bring death to me. By no means. It was sin producing death in where? In who? In me. Wasn't sin in Satan. Wasn't the sin in Eve. It was the sin in Adam. It was the sin in Eve. That, in lo that is where the problem lies. The problem lies with you. The problem lies with me. It doesn't lie with the person sitting next to you. It lies with you. It's your sin that brings death through you, and the means by which it uses is God's law. Or we could say God's law shows you what it is doing. Right? Because what's the purpose? Why then do we have this law? Why then, you know, why, what's the purpose of God's law? Well, Paul says right this. Why, why does this process work this way? Paul says, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. So that you would know that you have a sin problem. The law shows that you have a sin problem. And through the commandment, that, you know, the commandment, thou shalt not, might become sinful beyond measure. So you could see, or at least get a glimpse, and I think a glimpse is a better term, how sinful you are. And the reason I say a glimpse is because I don't know if any of us could really truly handle the truth about how bad we really are down at heart. And in some ways, that might be God's mercy. Because I'm not sure that's something we'd really ever recover from. In fact, you, you hear some of the stories of the ancient preachers, or ancient preachers, I say ancient, and then we're talking 1700s, right? <laughs> Wesley's, and um, not just Wesley, but Whitfield. And guys would lay prostrated like in the streets for days, just broken over what had happened. And their sin and, and seeking God's forgiveness. You know, there's just this reality that that's what God's law is there to do. To show us how sinful we really are. And how much we truly need God's mercy and His grace. And see, that's the thing. You need to know who the enemy is, right? Why? So that we would see, so that you'd see your sin. And you can't fight what you can't see, right? If you don't know you have a sin problem, there's nothing you can do about it. Think about Pearl Harbor. What was the problem at Pearl Harbor? Nobody knew it was coming. Right? The American Navy did not know that the Japanese Navy was sitting out there, that they sent planes, and they were going to get bombed. So they weren't ready, were they? They weren't ready. And that's so often true with us. We are not, we don't know our sin, we can't see our sin, and so we are helpless against the workings of sin in our hearts and our minds. God wants to show you just how big your sin problem really is. And your sin causes you to die so that you might see your own sin clearly. Right? Sin brings death. It brings all kinds of death. Yes, it brings spiritual death, separation from God. And really, that's a good way to think of death as separation, right? Because when you die, when you, your phys physical body dies, are you separated from the people of, this, of earth? from your family you're separated aren't you separation is a good way to think of death so when we die spiritually what we are now what separated from God and it brings that death and it brings death to relationships right when we sin we tend to not get along with people right and it brings death to relationships and often death to relationships brings real death in the form of war. And when we start talking about nationalities and people groups not getting along and sinning against each other. And so God brought in His law to show us the issue. And that's our sin. Now Paul's going to move here to 13. And so, what causes you to sin and to die and these things? It's our sin, right? Our sin is the problem. It's my sin. It's your sin. That is, in, that is what causes our death. And that's why we die. It's sin. Now, are you spiritual? Now, that's an interesting question, I think. Especially in our day and age. Because so look, look at 14. For we know that the law, so this good law is spiritual. 
but I am of the flesh sold under sin. I just want you to let that sink in. What does Paul say is spiritual? He says, the law. Now, there was a time and place in our American culture when we understood this. Okay? But what is our society's... Well, when you think of spiritual or spirituality, what do you, what do you think of? Oh, you know, some Buddhist monk cross-legged with his hands, you know, like so. You think of somebody doing yoga, right? I mean, somebody there, you know, at one with everything. Some ultra-body, out-of-body experience, right? That's spirituality. Somebody who's just like above you and says things backwards, Yoda. Anyways, so, right? Terrible grammar, by the way. You think saying the same thing backwards makes you wise, but whatever. <laughs> Right? That's kind of our idea of spiritual, right? Somebody who prays all the time, right? Like, and, and, you know, there's certainly a, 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 an element of spirituality, I suppose, to those things. But, law, but Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, you know, you're spiritual when you, you know, you just meditate all the time or you have this really good, gooey feeling of connection. No, he's saying you're spiritual when you walk in obedience to what God said regardless of how spiritual you feel in that moment, it's when you're walking in obedience to God. Because the law is spiritual. The law comes from God who is... Right, because God is spirit, right? So it kind of makes sense that if He gives the law, it would be spiritual. Makes sense, right? But we live in a world today that is trying to divorce these things. And I want to start here with just getting a little better understanding of this idea of are you sold under sin. I got this from MacArthur's uh, study Bible. He says, You are sold under sin. Sin no longer controls the whole man, as with the unbeliever. But it does hold captive the believer's members or his fleshly bo body. Sin contaminates him and frustrates his inner desire to obey the will of God. You know, Paul here, throughout a lot of this, he's talking about his own struggle, right? And is Paul saved? Yeah, he's an apostle, right? So there's this right idea, right? I mean, Paul has done a good job up to this point describing the unbeliever but now we have the believer but the believer still has a sin problem right he still has this sin problem that Paul's going to dive into deeper but there's just this reality as people we are all just have this sinful fleshly bend to us that's always working against our efforts to serve God now I want to talk about a minute. What do these fools say? And by fools, I mean those who believe that you can be spiritual without God's law. That's what I mean by fools. Because this is a big thing. So actually, CNN, they, I got this from CNN. They, they talk about this new term now. I'm spiritual but not religious. They say being spiritual but not religious means you do not need a church or a community. Some say a beach will do. I'm spiritual but not religious. It's a trendy phrase people often use to describe their belief that they don't need organized religion to live a life of faith. Now the Apostle Paul just said that the law is spiritual. The law would imply what? Organized religion. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was the apostles that said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. So that kind of means, if you're going to be spiritual, you're going to have to come to church. Sorry. Now, I'm not saying God's going to strike you with lightning if you don't come to church every Sunday. But, if you want to be spiritual, I mean, that, that's part of what it says, right? You have to come to the true church. I got another quote here from Dr. Emmett Ray. I think he's Hindu, or Hindu bent, you know, from that school of thinking. He says, Spirituality is not taking shelter under religions or prophets, but making deep union with the God that exists in every heart. I got another one here. Wealth, Waldo Emerson. Great American writer. He says, Make your own Bible. Select and collect all the words and sentences that in all your readings have been to you like the blast of a trumpet. Here's what they're saying, right? I can be spiritual without God's law. Right? I, all you need to do is connect with the God that's within all of us. Well, the only God that's within anybody is the Holy Spirit who's in only believers. Only believers is the Holy Spirit in. 
we're not all part of this God that we can connect, you know, by some alternate trance or pretend emptying our mind of you ever thought about that I empty my mind so I am not thinking about anything and yet I'm connected to everybody how does that work I don't know if you have nothing in your brain how can you be connected to anything but you know that's logic and how dare I enforce my western ways of thinking on an illogical way of thinking you know it's, well it's eastern thinking so it's okay if it's illogical Okay, whatever. But, who just wants to see this, right? Well, what are they talking about? They're saying, you make up your own religion. You can be spiritual without God. You can be spiritual without God's law. Now I want to tell, give you a quote from what I consider a wise man. That's Francis of Assisi. C.C. All right, just the reason I, I, I have this poem here, because here's a man that... Some would even within the church kind of put on the kind of the weird end of spirituality, kind of part of maybe some of the mystis, mystics. But listen to what he says, and I just want you to see how what he says is so different from what we've just read. He says, The Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much speak to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Notice everything Francis says is based on Scripture. Notice he's not talking about the God within, he's talking about the God outside of time and space particularly the God of the Bible, right? I mean, those are the terms he uses, biblical terms, to describe God. And notice how much of what he says identifies with words of Christ, right? For it is in giving that we receive, blessed it, it is more blessed to give than to receive, right? Pardoning that we are pardoned, right? If you do not forgive, don't expect to be forgiven, right? Forgive us our day, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life, unless a man dies. All of his spirituality is based on what? The law of God, isn't it? In God's truth. See, understand that all that other stuff I talked about, all that other stuff that our world said is spirituality, it's not spirituality, it's carnality. It's fleshly. It's sinful. It sounds good. It sounds, you know, ultra spiritual. You know, we're up here floating in the air and, oh, I've reached the pinnacle. No, that's just nonsense. No, I'm not saying if you don't walk in obedience to God, there aren't times that you feel really close to God. And that's not cool. But, I mean, I'm sorry. And, and that is cool and that's fun, but... That's not the goal because it's obeying the law which is spiritual. It's God's law that is, as I said, spiritual. And that's the, the reality of it, isn't it? And there's a story as we think about things being shown that I want to say right here. The story you, most of you probably heard of, right? The Emperor's New Clothes. Right, and as the story goes, there's this very vain emperor. He's all about, you know, show. He's all about his own clothes and how he looks. And one day, there's these two scoundrels come to town. And they say that, you know, they're, um, oh my goodness, the word escapes me, right? They're tailors, right? And they know how to make the most wonderful clothes. They're the most beautiful, most wonderful and style clothes you could ever imagine. But there's like this one little catch. Only those who are worthy of their position and who aren't stupid can see the clothes. So the emperor's, oh, that's a great idea, commissions them to go work, you know, work on these clothes. And the emperor's like, you know, I should probably send somebody to check, out, send somebody to check them out, see how it's doing. And so he sends his minister, like, you know, because he'd be honest with me. So he sends the minister, and the minister checks in, and 
he can't see anything. I mean, oh, they're there working and cutting away, and he can't see a blessed thing. But he's like, oh my, I didn't realize I was unworthy of my position or that I was stupid. But because he's afraid that the reason he can't see is because he's unworthy and he's stupid, he goes back to the king and says, oh yeah, it's beautiful, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And so does each one of his advisors. And then, of course, by the time they do bring it to the king and, you know, they present it there, and well, the king can't see the clothes either. But his ministers said they were beautiful and wonderful. And so did all of his ministers. Oh, yes, it's wonderful. Even though they're all thinking in their mind, I can't see anything. But I don't want to lose my position. And so the king's like, oh, my goodness. I'm unworthy from my position and stupid. I didn't know these things. Obviously, he was. But anyways. <laughs> and so he says, oh, yes, they're beautiful. And he pretends to put them on. And then they had this big parade. And they're walking through the street. And a little boy says, the emperor has no clothes on. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. And so the murmur goes through the streets. But yet the king... Knowing deep in his heart they're probably right, but still too afraid to admit it, continues on with the parade as if it was, he was in all his splendor. And you know, that's what the law shows us of our fake spirituality. That's truly carnality, doesn't it? It reveals to us that it really is nothing. But how sad it is that how often, instead of listening to that little boy that tells us, you have no clothes, we just keep on marching with life. The law is like that little boy. You have no clothes. And sometimes I think he laughs at us. Lady Wisdom laughs at your calamity. And so, are you spiritual then? Well, naturally, in of ourselves, we are not, are we? We're only as spiritual as in which we follow God. And then, of course, does your sin control you? Even as believers, we struggle with this, don't we? In fact, Paul's going to talk about in chapter 8 how to deal with this sin that controls us. Okay, Because as believers, that ought not to be. But so, 15. For I do not understand my own actions. And Paul's making the argument here. Right? He's, he's now supporting his argument. The law is spiritual. I am not. Here's why the law is spiritual and why I know that I am not. Why I'm sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. So Paul says, I know what the law says. Hey, I know it's spiritual. I know it says don't covet. And I agree. I think the law is right. I've been saved. I'm like, hey, I'm sinning and this sin is not good for me to do. I don't want to do it before. Before I was saved, I was like, ah, who cares? This is fun. This is good. But now, oh no, I've changed my mind. This is a horrible idea, but I keep on doing it. I keep coveting. I can't stop. I don't mean to. I don't try to. But I do. So I have this sin. And I don't understand why this is. In 16. Then we move to 16. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Right? And this is the, uh, like this quote, hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays to virtue. Right? Hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays to virtue. See, Paul's admitting, right, I know that the law is right, I know that I'm wrong, and I agree. In fact, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So when I do what I don't want to do, the problem isn't that I don't agree with the law. And this is why men of vice almost always claim to be virtuous. And this is why we as individuals, I mean, let's be honest. Even when you're confessing your sins, do you tend to downplay your sins a little bit? Oh, come on, be honest, I do. <laughs> Not purposely, but, right? You come and, and you're doing it, but, you know, you always put a little twist in there. Just, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't sound that bad, you know? Or you try to blame the other person like Adam. Yes, honey, I'm sorry I yelled at you, but you are such a pain. I mean, come on, really? I mean, I know it's wrong to be sinful, but if you knew how annoying you were, you would understand why I yelled at you. Isn't that how we tend to apologize, right? We're downplaying our sin to make ourselves sound better than we are. Why? Because we know what we should be, right? 
Right? This is why it's very. This is why it's actually very dangerous to be in any position of, of authority or power, right? Because we know virtue is good. We know that the people we lead, who support us in our position, know that virtue is good. So we need to make appeals to virtue. But the problem is, very often as leaders, we're not always as virtuous as we ought to be. So we become hypocrites, right? And that's, that's a very dangerous thing to be and to do. And that's why... But yet, in our hypocrisy, what are we saying? We know that virtue is right. We just don't want to do it. Okay? We know that virtue is right. We know what God said is right. That the law is good. So, in seven, so then 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And remember, this is why we're talking about a believer. Because a believer with his mind, and Paul's going to get, we're going to get to this next week, he, he's, he's trying to pursue God. But there's this sin within him that he's still responsible for that's working against him. And this is where you get the cartoon pictures from. you got the little devil over here and the little angel over here, and they're back and forth. And that's really just a cartoon picture of the struggle that goes on in people's hearts and minds. And particularly for the believer, because you have the Holy Spirit, right, over here working on me and convicting me, but I got this sin nature on the other side hitting back, right? And, and they're clashing heads. 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So Paul's saying, right, that... Me as an individual, there is nothing that is, I do naturally that is good, that isn't self-serving in some way, right? We might do good things for people, but ultimately a lot of times it's for our own benefit, right? Whether for it's to build up our own reputation or many other things, or so that we're in favor and we're popular. We could do good things sometimes, but many times for even the wrong reasons, right? Even non-believers can be very moral people. And so there are these things building up in their hearts and their minds. And Paul makes the point, how do I know this? Because I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to do it. That's how I know that there's nothing good in my flesh. I want to do what is right. I, I really do. I just can't seem to follow through with it. And then 20, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep... I mean, this sounds like an addict, right? Uh, that's A lot of this is what Paul's describing, and so we're all sin addicts. You know, whatever your favorite sin is, we tend to be addicted to it. And I think some of the hardest ones we don't even think about are things like gossip. You don't even know you're doing it till afterwards. And you can make, I mean, I'm not going to do this, and then, my goodness, four sentences into a conversation, it may hit you, or it may hit you when you're driving home from talk, after you talk to somebody, like, man, I said some stuff about people. It wasn't terrible, but was it necessary? Did it really add to the conversation? No. Did that person need to know it? Nope. But I sure talked about a lot. I mean, good grief, for crying out loud, I mean... I don't want to scare you all because I'm gossiping about you all behind your backs. You know? <laughs> but, you know, you, you think about it, you're like, well, especially as a pastor, I mean, shouldn't I have been directing the conversation talk about things of God and Scripture? And actually, as believers, shouldn't we be all doing that? Especially with each other? Like, really? You feel nervous about bringing up, hey, what do you think about this in Scripture? You, you feel nervous about doing that with other people who believe? <laughs> Instead of talking about so-and-so and what so-and-so over there is doing and what's going on over here. and You know. I've been convicted about that because I was listening to the Reformed pastor by Baxter and he's like, you know, like any conversation that's not talking about God is a waste of time. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Them old Puritans, you know. And so we got these issues. And then 20. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. When I don't do it, it's no longer I who do it. In other words, I'm no longer willfully choosing sin. Okay? That's the Paul's point. The Paul's point, I don't think Paul's point is, well, I'm no longer responsible because it's not me. Because don't take that away. 
Don't take that away. Well, it's not really, it wasn't me, you know, I guess if you were, you know, I had a bunch of siblings. It wasn't me that hit you, it was my sin. Right? Yeah. Yeah, don't try that at home. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's not going to... You're still responsible, but you're no longer willfully making the decision. It just, you know, it happens, right? Because you agree with God, you're seeking with God, and so that's, that's where we're at here. So what is the answer? Again, Paul's going to get into it, but we're going to stop here for today. I'm going to say this. Only God can cover your sinful nakedness. Because we talk about nakedness, right? We've talked about how the law exposes who we are. And it's not pretty. And we've talked about how you can't cover your sin. Right? Because, again, to go back to our illustration of Adam and Eve, right? They are trying to cover their sin. Both outwardly and inwardly. And inwardly, all they're able to do is blame somebody else. And we skipped over that. But we're going to go come to that. And that is this idea of victimization, right? You're not a victim of God's law. Now, what does it mean to be a victim? Now, this term victimization means the action of singling someone out for cruel and unjust treatment. Does God single you out for cruel and unjust treatment? No. It may seem like that sometimes, but He doesn't. But very often we have an attitude of a victim. Now please don't misunderstand me here because are there people who are victims in the sense that they are singled out by other people and horrible things are done to them? Absolutely. That happens, right? But we are never, even as believers, even when we are, are victimized to take that attitude of victimization. I'd argue that's a sinful attitude in which we are blaming other people for problems. Very often. And I say that in part because of even what the Apostle Paul himself says. Because he says later on in Romans 8, 36 and 37, he says, As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul is saying, Because of you, God, because we follow you, we are victims. We are murdered, we are persecuted. But yet we are conquerors. In other words, we're not going to say, well, they murdered so-and-so, so I'm not going to talk about Jesus anymore. We're not going to say, well, so-and-so isn't going to like me, or I could lose my job if I talk about Jesus, so I'm not going to talk about Jesus anymore. No, we are conquerors. We push back. We're going to proclaim the truth. We're not going to have this oh, woe is me attitude. And does that mean that there aren't real obstacles to overcome? Sure they are. But we live in a culture where everybody wants to be a victim because victimization is an excuse. Why, even in our parable by our puppets, the evil servant, right? Remember him? He, he, he buried his money in the ground. What was his excuse? Well, I knew you were a hard master and I was afraid of failure. I was afraid no matter how, I tr how hard I tried, the deck was stacked against me, so I just decided, you know what? I won't try. Now, how well did that work out for him? Jesus said you were lazy. See, an attitude of victimization, of being a victim, can sometimes lead us to not trying or blaming everything. And while there are people who are real victims, there's a lot of people, they're not victims. Oh, sure, life's been hard. But they're not a victim. But it's always, oh, the world's against me. I would do that, pa Pastor Ben. I would go get a job. But, you know, I, don't, I just don't know if, if I could make it or it would work out. You know, as the slugger says, a lion's in the street, so I can't go out to the field and eat me. We have excuses. That's what they are. And we have to realize as believers, we're not here to make up those excuses. That's part of our trying to cover our what? Nakedness. That spirit of victimization. We're trying to cover our nakedness by ourselves. Because how... So if we can't cover our own nakedness, no matter what you're trying, if you can't cover your nakedness, what do you do? Because you are naked. So what do you do? Well, that's where we go back to the story in Genesis. 
Because it's beautiful from the very beginning. So Genesis 3. Twenty one. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments and skin and clothed them. Who clothed them? God clothed them. And the same for our spiritual nakedness. Who clothes us? God clothes us. Because we go to the end of the back of the book. I mean it's beautiful. I mean, this is you see this throughout Scripture. You go to the back of the book, the back of the book. Yeah, Revelations. Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed, addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of Christ. Now these were those in the tribulation, but we see this throughout, particularly Revelation. And even Jesus talks about being clothed at the wedding feast. Talks a lot about being white robes, the righteousness of the saints, and Christ that clothes us. This is again and again in Scripture. We see this. It's God that clothes us. So we cry out to God. We turn to God. He's the one who takes care of our sin problem. He's the one that covers our sins. He's the one that Paul, at the end of 7, cries out, Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He's the one who helps me. Wretched man that I am. It's to God. You cannot cover your sin any other way. And that's the question that we pose, I pose at the end here. Are you trying to cover your own sin? Or are you relying in the God of eternity and forever to clothe you by the blood of the Lamb? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for Christ. We thank you so much for the coverings that you have prescribed for us, Father God. We thank you for your perfect law, Lord, that shows us that we need these coverings. And Lord, we pray, Father God, that we might point many others to you and your righteousness and your truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right, Abel, if you'd please stand as the praise team come forward and turn your hymnals to 549.